afternoon, Colorado Mesa University, and welcome back to another episode of Crossing the Line. My name is Matt Entrican, and with me is my partner, Sean Sullivan. Sean, how are you doing today? Doing great. This is a very exciting time here in the sports world. The four major sports all going at it at once, yes. and it's time yes. for us just to dive right in. Let's do it. Off the high board, into the water. Let's dive. Okay. So, as you're saying, the NFL still going strong, and that leads us into our first topic, which is... Joe Burrow, is he the new best quarterback in the NFL, excuse me, in the AFC? We're not talking about the whole league just yet. Joe Burrow's coming off a great performance against the Baltimore Ravens in which he threw for 416 yards and three touchdowns. So, Sean, I ask you, is he the best quarterback in the Africa? Well, I don't know if we, quite cro I don't know if we can quite crown him the king yet. That was a mouthful right there. <laughs> but we got it out. We can't quite crown the king yet, but he might be the prince of the AFC. I can't quite put in that number one spot quite yet. Cry oh my No more goodness. cues, Sean. No more no cues or quites or whatever. <laughs> Jeez. Okay. Well, Joe Burrow, like you said, has come a fantastic game with him and Jamar Chase, absolutely electric chemistry. Both of them connecting for a couple touchdowns. Jamar Chase, the clear favorite for the offensive rookie of the year. But we're talking about Joe Burrow for right now. For me, I need one more statement win from Joe Burrow. They come off beating the red hot Baltimore Ravens in a huge game for them. But I need one more win from the Bengals to quite uh, crown him the king, if you will. They had that close game against the Packers in overtime where they should have won the game, but no one can make a kick in that game. So I just need one more win from the, uh, the Bengals to really crown Joe Burrow the best quarterback in the AFC. They have the Jets this week, which is obviously doesn't look like a, a trap game, if you will, but it's an important game for them to sustain this hot streak they're on for the Bengals. They have the Browns coming after that. The Browns hurt a little bit, so not quite a statement game yet. And they have Vegas, and who knows what's going to happen with Vegas. Yes, it's quite a week-to-week -week story with Vegas on and off the field. But then on December 5th, they have the Chargers at home. And the Chargers also a red-hot team in the AFC. And we really, I think it would be a really good statement win to really say, hey, we're a playoff team. I'm here to stay if I'm Joe Burrow against the Chargers. So I can't quite crown him the king yet. I'm giving the nod to Josh Allen or Lamar Jackson right now. But we powered through. Couldn't speak, but Matt, now it's time for you to uh, uh, answer the question, is Joe Burrow the Africa King? Thank you, Sean. Uh, yeah, before I get started here, I just want to say like, something about you is different. I just can't put my finger on it. Just something about you. Something I smells off? Something smells funky. But anyway, uh, I just want to say Joe Burrow's win against the Ravens was enough statement win for me. I mean, 41 to 17, you did something nobody else in the NFL has done quite yet. And you did it against one of the best teams in the NFL. But I know we all like to use stats and numbers to say this or that, but we got to stop doing that so much. It's not <laughs> always about stats and numbers. Uh, here's what it's about. It's the fact that Joe Burrow is five and two, tied for the best or best record in the AFC, coming off of this great team, this great win against one of the best teams uh, in the NFL. Okay, uh, and here's the other thing about Joe Burrow is that he's been getting better every week. When you look at quarterbacks like Josh Allen and Lamar Jackson, they've actually been a lot more inconsistent than it seems. Both those guys have had three games with a completion percentage in the 50s. Uh, Joe Burrow hasn't even done that once, and he's coming off you know this, this tremendous game where he did it against one of the best teams in the NFL. And that's all I really need. Uh, I think the inconsistencies from Lamar and Josh Allen – have me convinced that Joe Burrow, he's not just the prince, he's a king. Joe Burrow is that dude, and it's a very exciting time to be a Bengals fan because you definitely, no doubt about it, you have your franchise quarterback. There's no question about that. But for me, the one thing is it's kind of crazy just because of how wide open the AFC is. We really have no clue what team's going to come out about it, and it's a very exciting thing to see if you're an NFL fan. Can I set it better myself? <laughs> All right, guys, that's going to send us to topic number two. We're going to switch over into some NBA talk. Now, the L.A. Lakers, they've had a bit of an inauspicious start. They've got some intra-team drama. Uh, they got LeBron James hurt. But that has not stopped the, the sweet, sweet love they've been receiving from ESPN and the media. And so that makes us ask the question, Will ESPN ever stop talking about the Los Angeles Lakers? Sean, what do you think? Well, like you said a little bit, like you alluded to, there's this team turmoil. Is it team turmoil or is ESPN just throwing the cameras on the Lakers all the time? Or even yesterday, prime example, 
Matt, tell me how many minutes did LeBron James play yesterday? Uh, I'm not good at math, but uh, I think zero. Did he even suit up yesterday for the Lakers? He didn't suit up per se, but he did look pretty damn good. Yeah, he looked sharp <laughs> and everything like that. But all over the ESPN Instagram, what are you seeing? LeBron James coaching up his teammates. Look at LeBron James. He's holding a clipboard. LeBron James is wearing glasses? Say what? LeBron James is the first person to wear glasses and get a triple-double every game this season, blah, 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 and just all this nonsense about LeBron James when ESPN could be covering so many other exciting things about the NBA. For example, the Bulls. Not very good season last year. They didn't make the playoffs, I don't believe. Now they're starting off 4-1. and one. The Knicks. For pretty much all of our growing up, the Knicks have not been great minus those couple years with Carmelo Anthony. Now they're starting off 3-1. and one. Warriors, 4-0. No. They do talk about the Warriors a fair amount. But, and then also the Jazz, 3-0. and oh. So those four are good storylines to run with and talk about. But instead, they decided to throw the camera in LeBron James's face and tell us stuff we really don't need to know. For example, he's holding a clipboard. Come on, ESPN. Be better. And you know, LeBron James holding a clipboard, it's not too bad. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I'll agree with you, though. I think uh, there are a few inevitables in life, and they are de death taxes, me winning every CTL argument, okay. uh, and <laughs> LeBron James and the Lakers being talked about by the media. I um, mean, we all knew what it meant when LeBron James decided to go to L.A. He already got talked about enough when he was in Cleveland, of all places. So I don't foresee this trend changing anytime soon. People love L.A., people love LeBron. I'm sorry, Sean. We might just have to live with it. I think we are going to have to live with it, and that's just what happens when you have the L.A. Lakers and they have a huge fan base. And the fans actually had a quite an interesting week. Going back to the NFL, the fans came out top and had a little bit of an, inc not an incident, but there was a trade for the first time ever with a fan, which leads us to our third topic of the day. In the Tampa Bay Buccaneers game, Tom Brady got his 600th touchdown, which is what happens when you pay for 40-something for years. Quite an impressive stat for Tom Brady. But a fan, Mike Evans, gave a, the, the 600th touchdown ball to a fan, and there was a trade going on. And, Matt, do you think this fan came off the good side of the trade? I don't have a lengthy argument prepared today. I just want to give you some numbers. And I know I said I wasn't good at math earlier in the show, um, but I did some calculations on my phone calculator, and this is all I want to say. So what this fan received in exchange for the 600th touchdown pass $1,000 in store credit, two Tom Brady jerseys, a Tom Brady signed helmet, both the jerseys were signed by the way, two season tickets, two sets of season tickets, Mike Evans game worn cleats. Now, when you add up the cost of all of that, the value, it comes out to $10,700. Now, per Ken Golden of Golden Auctions, he estimated this ball to be worth at least, at a minimum, $500 thousand dollars at least probably more so ten thousand seven hundred dollars compared to five hundred thousand dollars you know what that is in percentage 0.02 percent of the total value that's all i want to say that's all i want to say there's a lot of money that he's losing out five hundred thousand dollars is always a good payday but like you're saying he got two signed jerseys and all that good stuff he also i believe he got season tickets for this following season as well and to me i'm thinking more of the approach from not necessarily a monetary standpoint but from an nfl fan standpoint is that cool to have the Tom Brady 600 touchdown ball? Absolutely, that would be quite a bragging right to have in the man cave for all your friends to have a couple beers and watch the game, but hey, I got the Tom Brady signed 600 touchdown ball. That's pretty Probably that's a pretty good sweet. pickup line for girls. Absolutely, yeah, that's a <laughs> surefire. see my football? Yeah, absolutely, 100%, <laughs> batting 1,000. But also, looking from a fan standpoint, how cool is it to have two signed Tom Brady jerseys, which I think we can all agree, if he does want to sign, the value that's going to appreciate once Tom Brady retires mm -hmm. and inevitably gets into Canton, Ohio. And then he has an Evans, Mike Evans jersey and game worn cleats. Very cool to have. And then $1,000 and all that fun stuff. But also, think about it from this standpoint. Sure, is he looking, quote unquote, looking bad for losing the trade? Sure. But how even worse would he look if he refused to give up that 600th <laughs> touchdown ball? Tom Brady's got some connections, there's no doubt about that. And Tom Brady's also crazy. So I would say, <laughs> who knows what happened to the guy, but I don't think it'd be a very good thing. This football belongs to you, then Tom Brady's massive collection of awards and stuff that he's accumulated throughout his career, or belongs to Canton, Ohio, where it belongs. I think this guy got a pretty good deal and a fantastic story to say he was able to hold the 600 touchdown ball from Tom Brady. That's true. That's true. However, I will say, you brought up how is it going to look. Who cares how he looks? He's not a public figure. He doesn't have to worry about his reputation. Uh, get your money's worth, man. I mean, you have the, never in history has a 600th touchdown been thrown 
and he had it. He had it in his hands, a piece of history, something that's probably never going to happen again. And you could have really hiked up that va value a lot more. Gotten a bidding war <laughs> with, for the football. <laughs> war. Yeah, now it's also my understanding that uh, he also wanted a round of golf that he has not been able to cash in on yet with round of golf with Tom Brady. Obviously. Notably. Now, see, you had this priceless item that nobody else in the world has that will never exist again. You could have could have done a lot, man. Because Buccaneers needed it. They were going to get it one way or another. They were going to yeah. get one way or another. But all, all's fair in football, I'd say. I think, yeah. I, I think you had a good deal out of it. You probably did the right thing, honestly. I probably wouldn't have yeah, done anything definitely, differently. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, guys. That is going to lead us into our fourth topic, which very exciting. It is the return, the long-awaited return, that is, of the pie bet. Yes, we are in the World Series right now between the Houston Astros and the Atlanta Braves. So it is time for Sean and I to put our faces on the line as we bet on the winner of this 2021 World Series. So, Sean, I'm going to let you bet first. Who are you going with? Well, obviously, the most important thing is I gotta keep the money ma money maker fresh and okay and pie free. So <laughs> I may be reluctant with this choice, but I'm gonna go with who I think is actually gonna win, not necessarily who I want to win. But the Houston Astros are gonna be my pick to win the World Series. Obviously, a very uh, convoluted and complicated back past couple of years for the Houston Astros, but their core three of Altuve, Bregman, and Correa have been there. Those three have been playing; they're almost beating. Derek G and those Yankees teams record for most playoff games played together. So the chemistry is there. The bats are hot right now for the Houston Nationals. They have Zach Greinke and crew on the bump, which is always a good pitching crew to have. And also there was a little bit of grumbling and rumors going around that in the ALCS versus the Red Sox, that there was possibly some whistling and other stuff going on, a little bit of uh, sketchy behavior, you could mm. say, from the Houston Astros which is not great from a legality standpoint, but it is great for a Houston winning standpoint. Because that means <laughs> if they are cheating, that means their percentage of winning is going up higher yet again. Is it ethical? No. But it's going to keep my face from pie free? Yes, because I think the Astros are going to win. Yeah, unfortunately, our pie bets do not take into account uh, cheating. So. No. But you know what? Cheating or not cheating, I think the Atlanta Braves can pull this one out. Yes, the Houston Astros have a great offense with not many holes in that lineup. And yes, they've got a, an elite bullpen. And yes, they've got a fine starting rotation. But let me tell you something that they don't have. And that is the magic. The magic of October. Something that few teams come along, but once they come along it, they're unstoppable. Just look at the Cardinals every time they won the World Series. Just look at the Giants in 2014. And most notably, the Washington Nationals, who found that magic in 2019, when at the All-Star break, they were a losing team. And they went on to win the World Series. And now the Atlanta Braves, who only have 88 wins, and they just beat the 106-win Dodgers, have come across this, this momentum and this power, and they've got it. And Freddie Freeman is his first time in a World Series, and they just got so much going before them. They got the nation behind their back, and this is just the Atlanta Braves' time. That's all I have to say. I think the Atlanta Braves in the long run are obviously is, we're at the end of the long run, but I think they do need that one little edge offense that they are missing from Ronald Acuna Jr. I think that may come back to bite them a little bit in the World Series when it comes to depth of bats, but this will be determined, and the loser will have a pie to the face. Yes, well, this now, this is your first pie bet. This is my first pie bet, yes. Yes. Uh, I will say my pie bet record, mediocre. I think I'm like two and two with pies. Got a chance to pie two people. Got pie twice. It's not fun. Not you could fun. say my percentage right now is 100%. I have not been pied in the face yet, so I'd say I'm the favorite right now. I don't know about that. I've got more wins than you. I'm been. Like, I've been correct more often. But I haven't lost yet, <laughs> and I plan to keep it that way. We will see. We will see. We will see. All right, guys, we're going to go into our next topic, which is our weekly shout-outs. All right, Sean, who are you shouting out this week? What stuck out to you? I'm going to head to the Meadowlands for my shout-out and shout-out the starting quarterback for the New York Football Jets, Mike White. Who? Mike White, who? exactly who? Mike White, the 26-year-old rookie from Western Kentucky. Robert Sala says, I want you to be my starting quarterback this week. 
uh, Zach Wilson obviously injured PCL. So it's time for Mike White to shine and get this start. They did sign Joe Flacco. He must not be ready to play right yet. But you know what they say, you can't stop Mike White. You can only <laughs> hope to contain him. Look at him. Say? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I, of course he's, they say that. And for me, this is also a really good opportunity for Mike White because obviously he's not going to beat out Zach Wilson. They got the second overall pick with him. He's safe. His job is not in line. But if Mike White does play really well and they somehow find a way to beat the Cincinnati Bengals, Mike White can find himself to be a permanent career backup or even with the lack of good rookie quarterbacks coming out of this draft class, he could find himself a starting job here in this next couple uh, seasons if he does play well for the Jets. But uh, I wouldn't say – I'd say I'm more confident in the Astros winning than I am in <laughs> Mike White finding a way to rally the troops and beat the Bengals. But it's going to be exciting and good for Mike White. Hey, you yeah, know, you could find yourself a little Matt Flynn, maybe a yeah, uh, who Brock knows? Osweiler. Absolutely, you never, yeah. Both those quarterbacks notably don't have a career anymore. But They got paid. <laughs> they got paid. Mike White, this is your chance. Yeah. Hopefully you can be more extraordinary than your name. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Very vanilla name for Mike White. Yeah. Matt, yeah. who is your shout out? Okay. <laughs> I will be shouting out uh, Atlanta Braves starting pitcher Charlie Morton, who unfortunately had an early exit in last night's game one of the World Series. But uh, he did have a very valiant effort when in the second inning got drilled by a line drive. Um, of course, by the Astros taking out the pitcher. Dirty if you ask me. But it got drilled by a line drive in the leg. He thought he was fine. Little did he know his leg was actually broken and ended up throwing another 16 pitches before they realized that he couldn't continue on. So I just want to shout out Charlie Martin for being an absolute trooper and throwing pitches on a broken leg. What do you think you could do professional sports-wise on a broken leg? Oof. Um, shoot pool. Yeah. Ping pong maybe. Uh, archery. Archery. What about you? Let's see. On a broken leg, I think that I can. Hmm. I can't kick a field goal. I can't do that with two regular legs. I can't kick a field goal. <laughs> but I could definitely ping pong and I oh swim. I could win a swimming match mm -hmm. if I did that. And also maybe some chess. Chess. That's I, a good no. One. I wouldn't do well at chess. Did I, you watch I, the Queen's Gambit? No. I think uh, I would definitely get outsmarted in mm -hmm. chess. I, it wouldn't. It wouldn't be well. It wouldn't do really good for me. Mm. But also, fun story. This win, uh, this Sunday, as we all know, is Halloween, and we we're having a little off-camera discussion between Matt and myself of who would last longer in a horror movie. There's going to be a poll up here on the CMU CMU TV page. We want you guys to answer who you think would do better in a horror movie. Who would last longer in a horror movie between me and Matt? Who do you think uh, the two of us would do better in a horror movie? Sean, I mean. I love you, man. You're a great guy, but you're, you know, 5'9 stature, you're a little <laughs> okay. light. I don't know if you could hold up against, you know, the murderers out there. Um, so I'm, I hate to say it, but I think I'm going to pick myself. I'd pick you too. I wouldn't do well in a <laughs> horror movie. I know that about myself. I'm, I'm not built to succeed in a horror movie, but I'm okay with that. Good I'm going to win a pie bet. So you should be comfortable. <laughs> yeah, I'm comfortable not surviving a horror movie. All right, guys, that's going to do it for this week on Crossing the Line. My name is Matt Entrican. This is Sean Sullivan. We'll see you next week. Peace.